Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm like sort of tool agnostic. I used to yeah. use Omnip Omniplan. It was also uh, excellent software. Pretty much, you know, that Gantt functionality. Um, that will allow me to see, oh, okay, I can take two weeks of this. Um, also in the printing process, usually printers ask for a lot more time than they need because they factor in their own contingency. And I know that. Yeah. Um, so I know QA they have to consider and things like that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And there's transport, which, you know, sometimes it can take longer or less I actually had my books uh, um, fall off a, a container once. It happens. Your, More, your, your books fell off a truck. The pursuit of, of excellence is something we're all striving towards. I want you to focus on what you do best. You need to have an approval. How many approvals? What are the steps? It's really about listening. If it's not documented, it's, it's not done. Thanks for tuning into In Systems We Trust the show where we dive into all things systems and processes and hear from the professionals that are using them to change the landscape of their organizations every day. Welcome back to another episode of In Systems We Trust. My name is Mark He, I am your host, and today I'm talking with Matteo Kosu. He is a process-oriented project manager specializing in content pipelines with almost 20 years of experience. He researches, analyzes, and develops workflows, which allow for the ease of handoff and transparency, while limiting the need for constant meetings and check-ins. Welcome to the show, Matteo. Thank you. Thank you, Mark Thank you for having me. It's yeah, you're welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, for the listeners, um, Mateo and I connected over LinkedIn a little bit ago and resonated on our love for Asana and workflows and process. And so we had a bit of a conversation and I'm glad we got a chance to uh, dive in a little bit more today. Mateo, if you wouldn't mind just kind of filling us in on you know the work that you do um, as a project manager at New York Consolidated, um, what your company does, and just give us some more background so we can get an understanding before we jump in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, as as you said, uh, I'm, I'm a project manager um, right now. Uh, I specialize in uh, fine arts books and illustrated, uh, <clears throat> which are very complex uh, um, content projects. Uh, although, like the finished product wouldn't necessarily. Uh, show so um, and uh, yeah I mm, am basically like uh, to draw a parallel I'd be like a producer for a documentary then you are ha I'm a producer for a, a big um, art book uh, which has a thousand people <laughs> that work on them um, and uh, yeah New York Consolidated is a new nonprofit um, that is launching um, a very ambitious mission to uh, serve underrepresented artists uh, and um, give them the tools and the opportunity of other um, other categories of artists and uh, publish their best work. And uh, we have a lot of other um, other um, ambitions, but I am uh, in the production section of okay. the actual books. Awesome. And I assume you're an artist yourself. I'd love to hear more about your background and how you got started in this field. Um, I am not an artist, actually, um, <laughs> but um, I actually have always uh, dealt with production and logistics. So always mm -hmm. actually dealt with the more um, empowering the artists to do their best work. I am a firm believer of in delegation also as a conceptual, like the vision of labor, especially in the artists in the arts field, because so many times because of budgetary uh, limitations and also because of org organizational limitations, uh, artists or designers are dealt with a lot of like, let's call it like a bureaucracy around a project that they don't necessarily have the skills nor like the they want to deal with. Um, and yeah. that's where like a producer in a content project such as a book or you know, a video or or um, or a podcast, that's that's their role to empower them. So uh, yeah, so I've always dealt with that. Um, fun fact: I actually I, I did study to I went I have a <clears throat> master in edition and publishing, 
And um, okay. <clears throat> I did um, start with um, something very, very di different from art books, which were fire safety manuals which sounds okay. very unglamorous, but um, if you think about it, uh, they have to be everywhere because of the law. And um, it's actually a very interesting, um, from an organizational point of view and assistance point of view, it was uh, where I you know, uh, cut my teeth because um, they were manuals that needed to tra be translated in nine to 10 languages. So, the InDesign file, this also this was like 2006, so like way before any project management software was fully developed, at least the newer ones that we so, so love. And yeah, it was, a, it was a great way to learn how to like uh, pull together, yeah, nine translators, nine editors, and you already have 18 people, the author, the designer, so a team of 20 people. Okay. With art being so subjective, I'm assuming then that the the work you were doing in the in the you know fire safety manuals was a bit more straightforward. There are regulations and things that are more stamped in stone, and then your work really comes in bringing together the individuals and the people to make the translations happen and and make sure there's consistency across the board. Would I be correct in making that assumption? Absolutely, absolutely. And um and honestly, like uh, you know. Art is one thing and publishing about art is another and there has to be structure in that uh, because a book is um, is basically like a magnet for pitfalls. There can be typos, there could be things that you have forgotten to uh, clear for publication and, and the book is printed and there are so many things that you need and de dependencies that you need to establish to meet those deadlines that like a, a distributor for example uh wants okay what what is fine art publishing can you dive into that a bit more we had a obviously a quick conversation before we hit record here and you said that you often will be in situations where people ask what do you do and you know you, you some you relate it to a producer right a television producer music producer whatever it may be bringing people together how does that translate in the fine art space Right. Um, so fine arts pu publishing is anything you'd find, uh, let's say, in any big museum that you that in our big cities. So like, let's say the MoMA bookshop will have uh, um, a lot of catalogs, um, a lot of like monographs about one particular artist or um, even more complicated books about um, an, a particular exhibit with, I don't know, tens of artists. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in publishing, fine arts uh, would be divided between like either like photo books if, if to make it uh, or like another term which is not loved, but it does communicate coffee table books. Um, right. And um, yeah, I mean, um, anything from I can actually show you guys anything from like a monograph. This is Anna Opperman uh, published by the uh inventory press so, so like you'll have one artist and uh her artwork and a bunch of essays uh, to mm -hmm. preface it or anything like this just in time for the euros it's uh, like essays about soccer and interviews and um uh photography essays and so forth so this again is 256 pages, wow. 18 people working on it. So as a producer, I do pretty much what a producer in a documentary would do, would be to like, again, enable everybody to do their own, their own best work, keeping everybody on the same timeline <clears throat> and make sure that dependencies and bottlenecks are respected and avoided. Okay. How do you do that? Look, look. Let's start right there and, 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 and jump in because you're bringing all these people together. You know, your job is to keep the project on track, you know, on budget, on scope, all of those things. And so where does this start? I'd love to understand the full timeline, right? Um, artist, maybe one artist is leading the project. They have an idea, a thought. They have a network of people they want to resource to help them put this together. Are, are they approaching you? Like, where does the project start and how do you do your planning right and then actually get into the execution so that you can deliver you know the the final product right um yeah all, all those assumptions are correct um uh so i mean 
different publishing institutions and fashion publishing houses work in different ways without getting into the finer details on how the, the project starts or approaches or like on our we for example at new york consolidated we have an editorial director wh who approaches artists herself and then once she's decided uh, you know who we're going to support uh then uh, we uh uh, yeah, it, it, like we try to enable them to work with the network that they have. This is a very important thing in New York Consolidated. We want to be artist focused. Um, again, not every publishing house works this way. Many are more like structured and they have their own people. Some people have in-house. But um, but yeah, you're right. Um, we have to. So so we start by, again, having um, an initial conversation with the artist and um since it is a content project and it is a very a book is a very physical and like concrete object so like yeah. we it's it's that it's a good thing and a bad thing in a good way that we know exactly like what quality the content needs to be so we the first thing we ask is like okay this is your body of work has it been photographed appropriately um, or has it been scanned if it's if it's another type of uh, if it's a photograph, for example, has it been scanned and digitalized? Um, so once I ask these very the beginning like production questions, then we start assembling the team. So again, if the artist already has a, a, an editor, um, essay writers, uh, copy editors, uh, and we also, encourage artists to work with their own graphic designers mm -hmm. um the relationship between a graphic designer and the artist is a very close one it's kind of like a trifecta producer artist and graphic designer okay. um because um yeah so they need to like interpret the content the producer is there to actually bridge the gap because there are two creative souls and sometimes you need someone who is less creative, I want to say, to, you know, rough it up or like, like, um, sometimes like there's differences of opinion. So like you need an arbiter of, of that. Um, okay. so yeah, as you can see, like at, at the beginning, my position, my, my position entails a lot more like people skills than less than organizational skills. But then once those things are, 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 um, all agreed upon, uh, yeah, then like, uh, we rock and roll because, uh, usually everybody's like, oh yeah, we have 10 months, which usually is the, um, the timeline and everybody's okay. like 10 months. Oh my God. Yeah. Piece of cake. Inevitably, it always takes all around 11 to 12 months. And I know that and I factor for that. Um, to dip into like actual tools, uh, the Gantt functionality in Asana has been a great help. Um, as most people, I guess, who are interested in this topic will know, it is a, a fantastic tool to actually assign tasks and, and assign the dependencies of those tasks and make sure that like if someone doesn't meet one deadline, I don't have to go and redo the entire timeline. Okay. I can just like shift it and the, and the software will, um, will uh, shift the cascading tasks. This is really interesting and I wanna dive into it a bit more, but can, let, let's back up a little bit. Um, and I, I just wanna say this show is not sponsored by Asana, but Asana, if you are listening, you know where to reach me. Um, okay, so yeah, we're, we're talking about the tool, we're talking about the, the timeline or Gantt, you know, style planning in Asana. And so when you have your project, how do you, because um, you said you, you, you build in contingencies, you know, it's going to take, you know, 12 months, or it, it typically does take 12 months, but you know that it, it should be around the 10. How do you build in those contingencies? How do you um, plan and prepare um, the rest of the team for that work? What does that really look like before you actually get into um, the actual planning itself? Yeah, um, so um, my, so my, my um, let's say it's, it's kind of like a white whale kind of thing to like get everything 
going super smooth. Um, I have approximated to the, the perfection, but had not never attained it. Uh, but so that's exactly it. Like I do factor in some contingencies usually um, between um, I give like editors more time than they actually need that I found. I, I know that there's some tasks that have the biggest like um, that are that might come up with the biggest problems. Um, so I usually uh, like factor in a couple of weeks more in editing because, you know, 60 percent of the times maybe they'll take a week. But there are there are times where they'll need more. So basically, it's it's you know it's something that like once you have it all planned out. And again, you said you said you said Asana for sure. I mean, yeah. I'm like sort of tool agnostic. I used to yeah. use Omni Omniplan. It was also excellent software. Pretty much you know that Gantt functionality. Um, that will allow me to see. Oh, okay, I can take two weeks of this. Um, also in the printing process, usually printers ask for a lot more time than they need because they factor in their own contingency. And I know yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so I there's know QA I'll... they have to consider and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And there's transport, which, you know, sometimes it can take longer or less. I actually had my books uh, um, fall off a, a container once. It happens you're, more. You're, you're... Your books fell off a truck. They, they didn't know. They fell into an actual to the ocean. Um, wow. Um, that is actually in logistics, like hard lesson to learn. But that in logistics, happens. it happens more often than people think. Uh, big ship runs into a storm, and um, a couple of containers fall off, and that's why you have insurance for that, and that's why people. Um, do uh recommend you know shipping uh companies recommend that you always get insurance because that happens a lot more than you know anybody i've never worked on a boat uh, or a ship so i didn't know like, that happens a lot there are so many questions i want to ask around that but i know it's going to take us way too far off track okay so you're building contingencies because yeah printing shipping okay good to know but yeah so and and those and those are factored in in my gantt chart um, and uh, so at the beginning, I'm taking the, the full 12 months. I always consult with the editorial manager, with the publications manager um, to uh, assess what the best like release date is. Okay. Um, and, you know, so there's ways that I can like extend or compress those deadlines because I know where the, like the, the troubled points are. Yeah. Um, and I know what other player in my team is actually factoring their contingencies. Okay. So I always know that like, oh, you guys, you could do this in a week less if right. we have problems. Okay. Um, I'd love to know who your, your, your key stakeholders are. Like we have the designer, we have the artist, you talked about your editor. Who are those people? And are you planning a, as, a, as a group or does it start with you? Um, drafting out the timeline and then bringing it to them for input before you build out your your backlog of items. This is a um, yeah. So this is a it gets into like my my personal way of how I work. Not everybody works like that. Um, mm -hmm. I find it a lot easier for me to start off and. Um, when I talk about researching, I mean that like, I always wanna empower, I've always wanted to do this, but like even more now in New York Consolidated that we, that um, the mission is is to empower and support artists and, and their network. Okay. I want to uh, have people work in the best way they know how to. So I don't really wanna impose methods of work I want to see if they can, if like their methods of work, I can adapt to their methods of work. And usually that is, is 100% possible. Um, um, but again, like there, that phase of research, meaning how do you want the files? Are we all working from one single, um, let's say shared folder? Um, yeah. what kind of, uh, for editors, for example, 
What kind of software do you use? Because um, that could also like change the timeline. There are like old school editors, for example, that will only um, copy edit on printed paper. Okay. Uh, which obviously is you can like you can uh, probably uh, you know the zoom and, like the problem is that like then you have to re-enter re-digitalize those corrections. Oh, wow. um, so, yeah. So, you know, you, I, I'm, again, I'm not like, I, there's other people that are like, no, the, you are going to have to use this, but if, you know, some old, old, older, older professionals are comfortable on paper and then on paper we do it. And that's uh, when we actually have to factor in another week. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it kind of starts for me from the research and another really important thing that like most people don't think about is um, I'm always working with uh, um, freelancers, most, most right. of them. So they have other projects and it's very, very crucial for me to ask the questions in like in eight months time where we're going to be crunching to go to print. Um, do you have any other projects starting? And that's very important because then I will, you know, change the timeline accordingly. Okay. Interesting. Where do sponsors and like advertisers come into this as well? Are you, um, you know, raising funding? Uh, is someone else on your team doing that to, to fund these projects? Yeah, so I mean, this is a um, this is a, a nonprofit, so it does have a, a board and it does uh, raise uh, money for the publications here, uh, donation based and so forth. Um, this is actually very interesting in terms of um, of um, um, uh, of systems, and because we started from scratch, and I was the one who set up their um, basically their pipeline from the donations to link with the budgets, then to link with the print runs, and um, um, and that is mostly done in in Airtable, for example. Um, okay. But um, so yeah, so funding it goes through there. Um, there's so many types of publishing that like funding can come from a lot of places, but, um, right. but for nonprofits, the book is usually 100% funded when we start the work. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested to know, cause you kind of went there and you said in the beginning you were doing it all yourself and it's kind of evolved as we think about process improvement, what has the evolution of, you know, your work looked like? from you know you're you're looking at you know fire safety manuals you're transferring over to arts and you're you're connecting with these people what has that looked like how have your systems evolved and like what within your tools what um sops have you developed or templates within something like asana what, what has that all looked like to get you to the point you're at right now where you know with certainty that you know a project will take this long and and you can plan it and make sure that you deliver well, what does that evolution look like um, yeah, I mean, I, that's uh, it's a great w way to see it. Um, I um, actually uh, try to see my templates, and I, I do have a lot of templates uh, that I use. I, I produce a lot of, like, how-tos, because, again, I work with different people all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And I see it as, like, uh, condensing, like, the years of experience of I've had into working this in something uh, which is not just in my head because uh, a lot of people work from like pure experience which is great again their method works for them but I have to have everything written down and like sometimes the best way to like write down things are is a simple like Asana um, template uh, yeah. with the timelines and everything and um, you know, you just give it a start date and it, it will translate. That is how like I've condensed um, the, the contingency, the, you know, the, the, the process of researching, asking people, all of that stuff is like condensed into an Asana template. Mm. Now in 2021, um, before there were like the good old to-do lists, it, uh, the, before it took a lot more like, sort of like 
having stuff in different places and like remembering where to find it like oh editor you need a way to like use like the in copy in design at workflow let me let me fetch it for you right now i think with the 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 um, the advancement of these project management tools it has made my life a lot easier and i think it's a lot easier for people to learn one tool instead of actually yeah. having me like direct more like a, a opera kind of uh, uh conductor uh now it's more like i am like ushering you through this process and i'm helping you out but like you have it all written down at any time right <clears throat> how, how do you how do you handle change management because uh, I, I can assume that, you know, with, you know, the different artists and different opinions, and different thoughts, as, you know, you start to see mock-ups roll out, um, you have your milestones, you have your deadlines, and it's your job to keep the project on track. Um, and so how do you handle, you know, change management, approvals? What does that workflow look like to make sure that you are staying, you know, on, on with, within scope, budget, and then, and then your timeline? Yeah, this is uh, in creative and content, this is uh, crucial. Um, in fact, um, most, uh, you know, designers and editors, anybody who like works on the actual content will set a limited number of, uh, uh, of reviews. Yeah. Um, which, you know, obviously like uh, it's, this is uh, very important. So, um, what I uh, usually factor in and offer, like in the quote itself, uh, I always ask for two rounds of reviews. That is usually enough. Mm -hmm. um, this actually needs to be, um, uh, this actually needs, but this is like enough because we've had these conversations before and we've set really precise yeah, milestones and ways of working before, and we've set responsibilities um, in saying like, um, for example, if the, if the person, sometimes there's a publisher and a co-publisher and that they have to do final approval, um, that's when usually the problem lies, but the problem on like, agreeing on creative, for example, needs to be resolved a lot earlier in publisher and co-publisher approving the designer themselves. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of more philosophical because like reviews could be smooth or they could go on forever. And when they do, it tells me that like there was a step that wasn't done properly before. Do you, you know, because it, if you like someone like, you know, designers, you know, it's the same process as, as, as an architect, for example, yeah. like, you know, if you've seen this architect's work before, you know that it's going to be in line with what he or she has done before. Mm -hmm. So like if you if they surprise you, it means that like, you haven't done your research properly on how these people like their creative vision. I, I would love to go. I'd love. I'd love to go there for a minute, if if, if I can interrupt. Sure. Can you think of an example or a time where something like that happened, where it went wrong, where maybe we weren't as diligent in the research, and you know, um, we we put in a change management request, or um, and you know, th th there was an understanding that we have a set amount of revisions, and you know, whoever it was was not okay with that. Can you tell us about a time where it went wrong and you had to go outside of the norm and maybe it delayed a project? Yeah, um, so, I mean, um, we work with a one on one book. Uh, we worked, we were like uh, more than, uh, like there was a, two publishers involved and there was um, a younger designer that was brought on board uh, and uh, actually before my time, but wasn't properly briefed on uh, on budget, on scope. So the problem there, again, like I didn't know that he hadn't been briefed, um, but like when the, the first concept, uh, graphic concept came up, the artist was okay with it, but nobody else was. Um, and then so like we actually had to backtrack and review what he was designing for that was the the problem i actually didn't even like 
share that concept because I knew it was going to be rejected. And um, it was actually a lot easier to backtrack instead of like trying to like shove it down people's throats and say, yo, it's yeah. good. A lot of people with creative think that like sometimes it's just a matter of subjective opinion, which it is in a, to an extent. But most of the times there is a very precise scope. And like once I saw that, I knew that that scope wasn't that precise. So yeah. it was a lot easier for me to go back have a meeting with the artist and the designer, go back to the scope, go back to the actual budget that they could use, and then sort of take uh, we took two weeks more and then went back. I think it, it, it definitely, like, instead of, like, I could have chanced it, maybe they would have been okay with it and I would have saved two weeks, but I, in this way, it was like, it was like, do I risk it and I'll lose a month if it's not, or do I just sh surely just lose two weeks and I yeah. went with, with conservative option? Yeah, I think you made the right decision in that case. Um, really interesting. Came out well, well, the book is uh, reprinting, so that's that's always a good good sign. Okay, that's awesome. Um, yeah, let's get back because earlier you talked about you know you're coming back, you're coming and bringing your team together, and people are used to using different tools and methods and approaches. And so, h how do you how do you handle that? I'd love to know what tools you use. We, we've talked extensively about Asana. You mentioned Airtable quickly. Can you talk about the the tools that you use? You know, within a project um, lifetime to to get the, the project across the finish line? Like, what do those things look like? And, and how do you manage, you know, having to maybe learn a new tool or onboard, you know, a, a, a team member or a project team member on, on something that you use that you need um, them to be well versed in? Yeah, um, that is uh, the most difficult part of any job, I think, um, is to, for starters, is to like, yeah, get people to use proper tools because the software companies keep pumping them out. And honestly, some of them yeah. hit or miss, but um, there have been amazing advantages in the, for content, Adobe Creative Cloud and, um, you know, Asana and Airtable. Um, and, and then also, especially like if you're working with content in terms of like sharing, so tools like Dropbox and um, uh, Google Drive. The problem is that like a lot of these tools actually overlap. Yeah. And so a lot of people, you know, like try to like fit a cube into a square, in, you know, into a round uh, uh, shape. And like that, like, I think my job is to minimize the amount of tools mm -hmm. and then like just squeeze them to their full potential. Um, in content, just to do an example, I usually um, just ask people to uh, have one um, shared folder do not and that like like one shell folder so like google driver dropbox um i ask everybody to be on the adobe creative suite which is uh very standard for designers not as much as editors mm -hmm. um but we can go back to what big problems that interaction creates and for their um uh for managing uh timelines i don't i, I I use Asana for my internal team, um, but I can export export um, Asana timelines uh, into a Google uh, calendar, which is usually all people need. And it's, it's a calendar that they subscribe to, and I just give them a heads up if something has changed. I'm like, hey, look, this has changed automatically. Like, give it, give it just have a look and see if anything has, is okay with you. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I know that I could actually use them, like use uh, guest features in Asana, but like, again, I try to do this, think of, as simple as possible. Okay. And yeah, and I'd love to know, like, are, are your processes documented and housed in Asana? Are they in your Google Drive or, or Docs? Because a question I always love to ask our guests is how they provide that clarity for their team members, because there's this, you know, lurching issue um, 
uh, that, that's called work about work and it's actually a term that Asana coined where like there's all the in-between stuff where people are trying to find out how to do something or find out where uh, a file is stored or what the deliverable is or where that date is and so well, how do you combat that problem work about work and then um, where do you store and house your 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 knowledge for anyone that's coming on to a project yeah, um, th th that's uh, definitely a, a huge problem in uh, bigger organizations for teams of about 10 to 15, which is usually what a, a book uh, entails. Um, I um, find it easier to have a meeting with the different teams at the beginning, but I do have um, a process, a very detailed process description which will say where everything is stored, where everything is supposed to be stored, and mm -hmm. where people will find the relevant information to their jobs. Now, okay. it is this in a perfect world, you, I, I tell you where everything is, I tell you where the document is, I'll see you in 10 months. This never sure. happens. Um, but that's fine. I mean, that's my job. Uh, at the beginning, I see that like, at the very beginning, like milestones, people will ask questions um, of, and I will e either answer them and point them to where they can find uh, the actual, well, you know, where the document is describing the process. And the process is like on paper, pretty simple. Um, where it gets complicated is obviously in the details and like meeting those deadlines and, and um, but uh, yeah, so usually it's a it's a combination of initial meeting, uh, very well detailed and uh, process um, description, which I go actually and like people get feedback from people because if they don't understand a part, I re rewrite it. And then, yeah, yeah. like, you know, constant, um, like, let's say support for my team. OK, awesome. I love it. Yeah, like with us at Ditto, we, we house everything within Asana. So we have all of our project templates. Obviously, we do our, our project planning, right? Similar to you, we often start with like the, the high level statement of work and we'll do our timeline planning and then break it down into different sprints from there till we get to the end. Well, when it comes to all of our docs, though, yeah, we store them all within Asana as well. We have a space called our SOP index. Mm -hmm. And so they're all listed there. It's it's obviously searchable and, you know, people can come in and th that's typically part of the onboarding is they need to go through that section as it relates to their role or their department and then they're looking and seeing okay how does this apply and it's often if they need to do something we're just copying a link here you go right, right. and then it gets people used to going to one place to to look for that for that knowledge and you know the the goal and I'd love to know how you include your internal team in this process because you started this, right? You know, you have this, you know, um, this knowledge about the system, the process, the workflow, it, it's yours. H how do you resource your team? Are they involved in the process improvement? Um, um, yeah, well, um, all? definitely my, my, my uh, the internal team has, um, it has the advantage of being internal and obviously yeah. uh, of having access to uh, the Asana, which um, I 100% uh, think that like, if I could actually put everybody on Asana it would be easier. But like, again, with people that m might only need to work one week really intensely, maybe it's easier for them than not having to go through that onboarding. Um, that being said, my internal team gives me a lot of good feedback, and we've been doing this, uh, you know, almost uh, almost a year now on what the best process, especially for handoffs, is, and to, um, you know, there's multiple projects at a time. Uh, the team might not only be focused on publications. There's you know, there's a fellowship, there's a, we actually have a, a, a physical space in Manhattan that we're launching. So like they okay. might be involved in other stuff. And like, so the question is more, um, how do I get, how do I get this stuff on your radar? And um, <clears throat> so that the handoff, I think is uh, the most important thing in internal teams. Um, I have used the Asana approval <clears throat> function uh, yeah a lot and um that uh, has simplified a lot of things um 
but yeah, uh, especially that I was I was I was talking about how the different tools interact. That's very useful. That um, you can put a, a, a PDF, uh, which might be like yeah. a design concept for approval, right mm -hmm. there. And they don't have to do that work of work of like, hey, Mateo, where is this file? Did you yeah. send it to me via email? Like, we don't have that anymore. They know right. that like once their task pops up in their my inbox, that that's all they need to do is click there and go on from there. Yeah, there's definitely some great onboard features. Yeah, that's a really good point. I can't believe we haven't covered this yet, but when it comes to the actual production, what, what's your approach to project management? Are you doing uh, waterfall? Are you, you know, scrum? Are you Kanban? What does that usually look like within Asana and how, do you, how are you managing? Yeah, um, so Kanban has been um, useful for me uh, in, in the very initial stages when I kind of need everybody to, the, the internal team, especially to see the different tasks and that, that need to happen. Um, but mm. then, um, on a project that has so many bottlenecks, you can't really edit a text that hasn't been written. Um, yeah. that needs necessarily to be a gaunt against, uh, kind of a structure. Um, okay. So that is that is like my number one um, my number one feature. Um, that being said, uh, it I have used other method methodologies in in other um, in other project management um, endeavors. Uh, I actually like took a break from publishing to help with the with the effort in uh, fighting the pandemic and joined uh, a, a company called Curative that was deploying mm -hmm. vaccines uh, uh, nationwide. And that was a team of 500, not 20. Wow. And so yeah. the methodologies there had been, were completely different. Um, but yeah, it really, you really need to be flexible as a project manager, but like for fine art books, like Gantt is, is where I would use, yeah. I agree. Awesome. All right. So as we're as we're wrapping up here, I, I love to always know if, if you're speaking to creatives, project managers that are listening in today, what's one thing that you think that they're overlooking when it comes to process improvement, work management, or even project management in this case? Um, I think uh, what we're overlooking, um, and I think process improvement is where we can hugely, hugely turn around how not only like creative or content works, I think a lot of companies and, you know, as everybody knows, there's a huge uh, push for hybrid work models and work from home 100%. Yeah. Um, it would be great for the environment. It would be great for quality of life. But um, a lot of people don't want to do it because they're missing those they're think they think that productivity will go down. Um, there's actually many studies that will prove the opposite, but productivity w is bound to go down if the process isn't there. Yeah, there's a lot of people rely on that face to face physical like reminder. Hey, Jane, I need that document signed. Oh, sure. I'll like, you know, I'll finish this coffee and I'll do it. Now, that input is obviously impossible through like without uh, without physical contact. But then again, like if we if we structure our workflow properly and like there's huge margins of improvement in that, like mm -hmm. we don't really need that. Right. And like the consequences of going to the office one day a week. I mean, I live in L.A. Everybody knows like you could literally live like a third of your day on that freeway yeah. just to go watch another screen i mean you know might as well look at your screen in your bedroom yeah couldn't agree more well thank you so much where can people connect with you or maybe even view some of your publications where, where are you hanging out online and spending your time these days um so yeah well i mean i would point um people to um um, well, per, my personal website is Mateo, M-A-T-T-E-O dot cargo dot site. Uh, it's pretty simple and I, you know, update it uh, from time to time, but it's got my, my um, most uh, the relevant work. Um, 
right now, yeah, I'm, I'm helping out New York Consolidated uh, in New York City. Very exciting time for artists. So uh, n hyphen y hyphen c dot org. Love it. All right. So thanks for your time, Mateo. Really appreciate it. I uh, wish we could keep on talking, but uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming on today and uh, sharing sharing this with us. Thanks so much, Marky. If you like what you heard today, please like, subscribe, and follow on your preferred channel. If you know of a friend or colleague that would benefit from hearing this conversation, please share it with them so that we can reach more listeners just like you. As always, all the links from today's talk will be in the show notes. And remember, if it isn't documented, it didn't happen. We'll see you next time.